randomly run into some more. Is it a session after this? Yes, I have. And quite frequently. I only found that out from Twitter.
This makes UIs work really well for a specific problem, which is to cite scholarly content somewhere. And um, because of these features that assist when you have metadata, you can build a central service, and that makes it easier than everybody trying just to figure out for itself. And that's basically the reason why UIs were started in the first place 15 years ago. And the link here I have is just one example where you can find stuff that this is find all papers funded by the National Science Foundation with a Creative Commons PC BY license. The catch here is, of course, this URL well works, but the metadata aren't quite complete, so you don't find everything that they funded in CC BY license, but it's sort of these infrastructure. And then finally, some things you might not know, because I see some experts in the room. The first, and I think most important one, the DUI, uh, there are several registration agencies that actually do all the work. And they are different. So they do different things for different kinds of contents. And one, one very important one is that the Entertainment Identifier Registry, for example, doesn't care about what's called the content. So the idea that DUI has anything that's called the content is just um, an educated guess, that's true most of the time, but it's not part of the system. Um, and because their registration is, you see, some of the things you like about DOIs are built by them, so they are different depending where you go. And a good example is metadata search, and not, not only do registration agencies and cross reference data sites do that, but they do this independently. So if you're a DOI and want to find out, when was this published, you have to first think about where we where find the information, and that's not really ideal. Something to help with is this link to take a DUI and the prospect API in this case tells you where this DUI was registered so you can find out more. Fixture DUI, for example, is a data set DUI. And lastly, DUIs and URLs. So historically, DUIs were sort of invented in the late 1990s, and it wasn't really clear where the web would be going, and it's, it's very much a parallel infrastructure for some to name resolvers. So the idea that there's a, there's a name to URL and then something attached to it that's sort of not relevant for DUIs. Um, but it's clear that the web has taken over, over everything, and so that most UIs are now used as a URL. And you use the link resolver, um, like DUI.org. But because they are URLs, you can do many things with them and you cannot do some things. And a good example what you cannot do is put funny characters in them. That was sort of the other days of UIs. There's something called a Siki, which is just so many funny characters that as a URL it doesn't work. Uh, what is nice is that you can do content negotiation, like with every URL, so you can do um, especially useful for the UIs to get metadata. So you could say, please give me what's behind the UI in web tech format so I can be part of my reference manager. And there's a link to how you do that. And something I learned recently is that because it's well, you can also use fragment identifiers. So which is to go to a part of an HTML document. And if it's a publisher, you can see that's a plus paper. You can go to the results section of the paper. And this is actually handled by your browser. It has nothing to do with the URL service. And the other example is for data set, which is a scientific movie, and you can say the link please start at 20 seconds, finish at 27 seconds, and this will all go through the UI system. Okay, so next part we're going to talk about Git. Can I get a show of hands who does not know Git? Okay, great. Well, this is good. This is good because we, 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 we figured that probably most people would, but we were hoping that some people might not. And Git is important, so I have a, a series of slides to explain what it is and why it's important. So I'm going to start with the why. Well, why do you need to know Git? The answer is that there are a large, an extremely large number of tools available on a service called GitHub. And those tools cover basic coding, uh, specialty tools, uh, infrastructure tools. And in order to make the best use of them, as they're on GitHub, uh, you need to know Git because GitHub is powered by Git. So what is Git? 
It is a piece of software that tracks changes in clients. It was created in 2005 by Linus Torvalds, uh, the guy who created the Linux kernel. And when I was putting these slides together, I figured out that Git is a little bit like Gandalf. It's a little bit magical. It's extremely fast. It's decentralized. Gandalf pops up all over the place. You never know where he's going to be. It's open source. He was very much about open information. It's very opinionated. It's cryptic. And it's very, very powerful. It has an extremely steep learning curve. I, I, I attended a workshop in Open Science in Melbourne a couple weeks ago, and the whole day was just getting people started with the basics of Git. So stuff that I had kind of like seeped into me that I just kind of knew through muscle memory, I had forgotten how steep the learning curve is. There's no getting away from it. The, the learning curve in Git is extremely steep. And I'm just going to read this cartoon so uh, This is a cartoon about just reading databases. Read so, how do I create a database? It's not a database, it's a key value store. Uh, okay, it's not a database. How do, I, how do I query it? You write a distributed math reduce function in airline. Did you just go tell me to go fuck myself? I believe I did, Bob. <laughs> now, when you get started with Git in the Git ecosystem and someone tells you, oh yeah, no, it's fine. You just need to clone the repo, create a branch, do a pull request, and then do a filter branch, and then filter those things. It can feel like this. There's no getting away from it. But notwithstanding that, once you get up and running and you find your minimum viable Git things that you need to know how to do, you can be very fast and it can start to feel like fun. Never wholly, but a little bit. All right. So how to get started? I would advise you to go and install Git. This talk is in a Git repository, so you can download this talk and you can just start, start, start playing with, with this, this repo. Here's a very, very brief lexicon for the confused. The terminology in Git tells us that a repo or a repository, that's just your software. Cloning a repo is just like making a copy of your software. Creating a branch is just like making a different version of your software. Different versions can do slightly different things. Making a commit in Git, you don't have to be too committed, don't worry. It's just adding a line of code to your software and, and keeping track of it. And a pull request, which in my mind is the single most confusing terminology in the whole of Git, the pull, pull request is asking if you can send something to something. Anyway. Okay. So there are a bunch of really good resources out there. One of them is called Git Ready. This is supposed to show a screenshot of that website, but it doesn't, so I'm going to move on. Uh, GitHub has some incredible help at help.github.com. Uh, and I would encourage you to download a good piece of client software, uh, GitHub themselves, and a very nice piece of software for the Mac. Again, screenshots missing, I apologize. Okay, so you know Git already. I'm assuming many of you do. But did you know that uh, basically here, here are four of my favorite tips for experts. Uh, you can use GitHub excellently for code review. When you do send a pull request to a branch, up to the point when that branch gets merged, any of the commits that you push to your remote automatically get updated in the pull request. What that means is that once two people have decided to work on a piece of code together, and someone sends the other person a pull request, they can have a conversation about that code, keep the modification going as the conversation happens until they're happy with the changes, and the pull request will get updated in real time and can get merged. And it creates an incredibly powerful mechanism for the peer review of code as you're working on. If you're looking at changes in GitHub, there's a magic tip in GitHub to ignore white space. It's really, really helpful. Uh, uh, there's a website called Git Secrets. I would recommend you to go with that. Uh, and you can customize the JSON out of your Git terminal and command line. Um, I've put a link here to a couple of customizations that I use to help me be more productive. I don't understand Git well enough to know how to write those natively, but there are so many help pages out there that you can find your own little formulas and magic scripts that help you do the things that you'd like to do. Okay. The whole point of me telling you about Git and GitHub is that there are a lot of resources on GitHub. Um, so, this is a screenshot <laughs> of a mechanism to take any Git repo and uh, add a DOI to it. So, in the last couple of months, people at GitHub have made that bridge between GitHub as a place for software which stands on its own and the scholarly record by enabling people to do uh, a, um, uh, 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 an assignment of a DOI into a piece of their code at a moment in time. 
I think that's, that's really interesting. There is um, a very, very beautiful website called Science Toolbox, which lists hundreds and hundreds of incredible pieces of software in GitHub for looking at science, but not necessarily for science. They also include text mining tools, tools that could easily be, be of use to people in the digital humanities, of whom we have representatives. All right, I'm going to give a call out to just a couple of uh, specific tools. Uh, the Open Science Foundation has uh, a kind of like social network tool up there. Um, Peer Library, their code base is up there. Uh, science Toolbox, its own code is on GitHub. Uh, a tool that we built at eLife, Lens is on GitHub. Um, just this week I saw someone tweeting that she would not be able to do her work without the aid of the tool Open Electrophy. Open Electrophy is a GitHub repo. Uh, Altmetrics, POS tool is on GitHub. Uh, BioPython is on GitHub. There are thousands of repos up there on GitHub. So we're going to move on to visualization. Yes, yeah, so I, this is my first attempt to make a presentation about visualization without showing any visualization. This text is just not a good idea usually. The main reason is I wasn't comfortable with how we do the presentation. I saw it in this presentation that that's probably challenging. Um, and also because it's just not enough time. So I just dealt with some principles. If you are new to visualization of scientific data, um, I think it's important to, to, to understand a few things, and that's not so much about technology, but it's just more about how you visualize something. I put a few things here to get started. One is one of, I guess, many, many books, and this one I really like, Visualize This, this by Nathan Yao, who writes, also writes a nice blog about data visualization, not, not just scientific, but in general, and talks a lot in this book about concepts, why you should use a particular kind of chart, and also some tools how you can use. D3 is a very nice JavaScript visualization library, and this link, there's just a nice gallery of cool visualizations that are open to active JavaScript based, but it's not, you can also use another tool, it's really about how you visualize interesting things and go beyond um, scatter plots and bar charts. And the first, third one, ggplot, is a, the nicest visualization library for R, the programming language. But it's really uh, what I like about it. It's also as a concept or grammar of graphics to think about visualization as, as a concept. That it's not just some random order of things that look nice and you have to make sure it looks nicer, but that there's pieces um, that you can, as building blocks, build together. If you start thinking about this way, the D3 is also very much with this mindset. It makes visualization much easier when you get um, into more difficult territory. And if you want to do visualization, there's millions of things you can do, and you should just decide what's your best fit and learn one tool and learn it really well. And I listed a few of that. Probably most of that was still done in Excel, which I guess is a good starting point, but you might hit the wall pretty soon. I like R. A language which is built for data analysis and visualization. Uh, D3, I mentioned already, is a nice visualizing library for JavaScript. It's more about things interactive on the web. Data Wrapper is an open source tool, but it's also a service that was put out by a group of German journalists, and that's a really nice service to just take a Excel or CSV file, put it on the web service, and then you can embed your chart in your web page where you want to use it and it's, it's an open source tool and it's mainly used by newspapers. And PRISM is one of several visualization tools that, that are popular among scientists. And there are good reasons to use one or the other, but you should just learn one pretty well. And when you do visualizations and it gets a bit more complicated, you, learn, you realize you really have to do some of the data first and that's actually maybe the harder part. So it's nice to know a little bit about this, what to do with things like missing data. And in particular, the painful part for me is always data transformation. So the data are not quite in the shape and format you want for how you visualize them. And this can be very painful to transform them. Um, and for these things, it's much nicer to use a, a tool or programming language, just like R, but it can also be Python, which is very popular for these things, or a new language called Julia, um, and not do this by hand. And 
this one is a very easy one and it's really, it's probably, publishing is always amazing that you find stuff that, where we got stuck in 1995. Side formats for graphics and images a good example, so we're still stuck with TIFF, if you're lucky, compressed format like JPEG or PNG, but it's totally inappropriate for a chart and not I mean, it's different from a microscope image. And this is also, if you do visualization yourself, please use active formats. And if you do stuff on the web, use SVG. Um, and of course, you can also make data available that you use to generate the figure, but it's important that they go so much work with visualization. So by providing the data alone, that's not sufficient for making it easy to reuse your figures and especially modify. With a, something like a TIFF or a JPEG, you can just not uh, do any of this. And lastly, um, I think you should get inspired, especially if you do scholarly visualizations. If you read a lot of scholarly articles, you find out they're all pretty boring there. So people try to squeeze a lot of stuff in a very small space, and it's very difficult to get the message. It's more about correctness than rather than sending a message. So getting inspiration is important, looking at how other people do things, maybe outside of science and scholarship. And a very good example is mapping. So there's a lot of cool stuff happening with mapping data geographically, and I think that's also very relevant for science. And of course, part of this, and that's sort of for people like us, publishers should be able to handle. I mean, just starting with the file format that's smarter than TIFF would be a great start. So if people do these things, they should also be able to appear in published paper. All right, I'm going to do, well, going to walk through what a quick demo of integrating all of these tools could look like. Um, again, one for the screenshot, we need a tool called SciPy Notebook, which is actually the tool that this presentation is written in. So what we've done is um, we've taken this one of these URLs, Crossref API, we've made a query against Crossref API to look for some DOIs plots. Um, we get the DOIs. Uh, we see that they're in a variety of forms. They look just like markings that they would. It's a good thing. Uh, um, do a little bit of work to clean them up um, and chop off the tenons and the DOIs. Uh, and then I just filter those for unique, unique DOIs. Um, and then I get a piece of code from GitHub that kind of wrote to wrap around the plus ALM app. I pass my DOIs into that app and I query for. Uh, Events, Mendeley reads, um, uh, views, and citations. Uh, I was trying to get the Mendeley API to work, and I woke up this morning and realized the Plus ALM uh, actually provides Mendeley reads, so I wrote this, this just uh, 10 minutes before the talk started. In a query, we get those kinds of pieces of data, um, and within a tool like IPython Notebook, you can pull in various mechanisms for graphing or visualizing the tool. I'm not going to make a guess on what the likelihood is that my graphs come up now. Uh, we'll find out. So in this case, I've used something called Matplotlib. And uh, I've just graphed the number of reads in an ordered set on those DOIs. And we see this, this kind of very classic decaying uh, exponential form, which you might expect. I wanted to have a look and see what the correlation was between reads and sites. Not enough time to get any citations yet. Uh, but there is uh, a scatter plot against mental reads, although I don't think there's any correlation there. But the point I want to make about everything that I've shown you here is it's all wrapped in this thing called an iPython notebook. And so the whole thing is actually available for other people to get on GitHub and start playing around with this data in examples. Um, this is the notebook here, running on my local machine. But I can actually pop that over to uh, this URL and share that with you on a site called NB Viewer. When you go to NB Viewer, the whole thing comes up. And so everything that we've talked about in the talk today is available for you to download in your own Git repo, run in this tool, and start playing with all of the things we've talked about. Uh, we've added in links to the resources we've described. I've added in some additional information about how to do visualization in my Python. Um, and the last thing I would say is um, if you'd like to talk to us about this a little bit more, 
I will be available on Tuesday at the London Book and Drinks. And, and that's it. That's all that's what we wanted to show you. So thank you very much for your attention. Yes? Um, it's lovely that you're giving us this, but I have no idea how to find this. So how do I find your presentation? So the link, the, the link, the, the links will be updated on the Etherpad for this session. Where do I find the Etherpad for this session? I'm sorry, no, I. No, that's, that's fine. So the, um, the, the, to, to find the Etherpad for the session, you find the Etherpads for all of Wikimania, and it's. They're, they're not opening on my device, so I've not been able to, to see them. Uh, okay, so the submission page basically is a link there. Yeah, we'll have a link on the submission page, and she. I'm curious. Yeah. Do you actually use a uh, MVD word to display the uh, uh, slide like layout? Yeah, yeah. So that's what that's what I've done. Okay, but yeah, yeah. So like, um, it's powered as a conversion powered by um, MVD word. So is that URL on there work with the URL? Oh, so this this URL is running off the local host. So it's, it turns it turns the iPython notebook into a HTML JavaScript set of slides using um, yeah reveal.js. <coughs> and no way, just to using the standard MVD word to see the uh, that uh, that uh, so slide can out. Yeah, yeah. So so it's just it's just a command line option from and uh, from yeah. So if you if you install iPython and iPython notebook, then this spins immediately off. The notebook as a slide deck because in the um, iPython notebook we have options on what each of our cells are. So here I can choose them to be just a regular cell or some kind of cell that's available to be turned into a slide deck. So does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Yes. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I only learned this on Monday, so it's, the, the learning curve on this is much lower than the learning curve on Git. Yeah. Cool. So, it, it's about the UIs. You know, an exponentially growing body of data. You know, the DOI is the way to identify items of data going forward. The cost, the cost effective, the useful way. Well, my view on this. This is, many people on. have touched on their hands. Is number one, I don't think there's any argument for against cost in using UIs. And it's really about whether you need something persistent. So if there's, if you have, if you work in CERN and you produce data every day in terabytes, mm -hmm. why should every piece of data have a DUI? Because it's, they don't even keep it permanent because it's too much. So everything that you want to have a DUI, I think it's fine. If you have one trillion DUIs a few years from now, I don't see the architecture of the system. That's, I mean, it's a more general, general question as well, because you, it's not just about DOIs, it's about what, any system to capture the metadata on an exponentially growing field of underlying data. Can any system be cost effective? So you, you could substitute the DOI with a uh, magic wand, with uh, handles. Um, it's always just going to be the race against where the value of the data lies versus whatever system we lay on top of it to keep track of where that data is. And I think that is a question that funders and researchers and the public have to answer together around what are the bits of data that we want to have that high granularity of, of uh, metadata on top of. Um, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, we can move on to the next session, but yeah, so. While well, they're switching, I think we can have one more question. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Sure. Sorry. So I was just going to say, I think one of the um, other things that that we have to think about is the role that DOIs play. If it's a citation identifier, right, mm -hmm. um, there's yeah. something weird about the way the DOIs have been used by SMART, which is that they've always been assigned when, the public, when something is produced in anticipation of its being cited. And if you follow that model, then you will be assigning a DOI to every record, right, in anticipation of its being cited, which is cost prohibitive generally. But if you reverse that and say only assign the DOI when it is cited, um, then you actually um, make it far more efficient uh, to assign DOIs um, in, the, in the context of citation.
So it's just, I think that there's another thing that we don't really think about. Um, you know, I think that the model for assigning DLL probably has to change uh, with things like data and multimedia. Okay. okay, thank you. We're now moving on to the next session, which is called Open Knowledge and National Institutes of Health. We have with us the board, who is the Associate Director of Data Science at the which is a new position that has the aim of actually opening up the data that is produced by the NIH and by the uh, research and findings. And I think that intersects in many ways with things that we are doing at the media uh, movement. We're also trying to expose the data that we produce in a fashion that uh, allows it to be reused in a number of contexts that allows it to be integrated with uh, things that other people do. And uh, yeah. So I invite Phil to give us some thoughts on how open knowledge uh, works in the context of being average. Okay, thanks Daniel. Thanks uh, for having me here. It's actually an unusual place for me to talk, I think. But I really, I'm here because I really would love to engage this community uh, in some of the things that we're doing. Um, and I'm sure we have a lot to learn from this community. So that's really um, my message. Um, I've had some instructions on things to say. I have to say, I don't think I've ever given a talk, and goodness knows I've given lots of talks, where someone had actually gone over and looked at things I'd actually done in the past and made such constructive criticism about the things that I should say. It was actually pretty impressive in itself. Uh, I guess it's all part of the movement. Um, so I'm just going to say a little about the NIH, because uh, that's sort of uh, sort of driver for me in this. Um, it's really about fundamental research um, in biomedical uh, in the biomedical arena, and that's both basic uh, and also clinical. And uh, that uh, you know, it's it is the main driver of biomedical research in the United States. Um, and it does a lot of things overseas as well. It has a thirty billion dollar uh, a year budget, and that money is spent, uh, as you can see, proportionately about. Uh, 17% of it is spent in-house, and the rest is actually given out to uh, investigators, and it drives, uh, it drives uh, the, the sort of biomedical ecosystem in the US for research in academia and other places, and non-profit organizations. Uh, there are lots and lots of different stakeholders in all of this, and uh, the, the Wikimedia community has not, I think, really been a stakeholder in, in, with respect to this before. And I think, as I said, that's what I would like to sort of um, engage folks. And, um, you know, I think there's a growing awareness that it would be good to do this. And, you know, examples of that are, if, even if you are not even a scientist, uh, or certainly not a biomedical scientist, I think there are many things that can be contributed. And I'm, I just have a little story which sort of reflects that. Uh, I actually, started one of the public library of science journals with a couple of other folks um, in which I opened access journals. And while I was the editor-in-chief of that, I actually once received a paper that was a very well-written paper, scientific paper, written by one author on pandemic modeling. This was about trying to predict uh, the, in an H1N1 break, outbreak, for example, how quickly does that spread uh, and where does it spread to? And, Obviously, predicting that kind of thing with modeling ahead of the, the event could actually save millions of lives. So it was actually something that was written very well by a single author. And I wasn't an expert in that field, so I sent it to someone called Simon Levine, who's a Kyoto Prize winner, which is a, a big deal in science, taken to the Nobel Prize. So someone who knew a lot about this, they said, wow, this is really a special piece of work. So because of that, I, the, the fact that at the time I was in San Diego, uh, the author lived there, so I arranged to meet with her. And we discussed the work. So what's the big deal about all this? From my point of view, which has driven a lot of my thinking in this area, uh, the big deal was she was 15 years old and she was a high school student. And she wrote a leading uh, scientific paper. And she did it because uh, she had access to the literature, uh, the open literature. She, uh, she actually wrote to Wolfram and got a copy of Mathematica to do the simulations. Uh, she, she wrote to the San Diego Supercomputer Center and got hundreds of thousands of hours of computing to run the simulations. So the point being is that anyone can, at any age can contribute to <coughs> what's going on in science. 
and uh, yeah, that's the sort of thing that drives me here. I think it's also a community that is very much in tune with the way that you, know, you all think, I'm sure. Um, it is a community where, at some level, knowledge is readily shared. And, you know, the community, how many people here are actually familiar with PubMed? Oh, <laughs> okay, so I'm probably um, not speaking quite at the right level, but uh, I mean, I think the, accept that the availability of tools like PubMed um, are, you know, uh, obviously drive this uh, community in a sort of open way uh, in, in terms of knowledge sharing. And, um, you know, I think these are enormously uh, valuable resources. So, uh, we had policies in place to sort of even take that to the next level and that's really what I went, drove me to uh, leave my sunny place in California and go to work at the, in Washington at the NIH. So for example, the sort of things that are happening that are drivers for, for even further change and more openness and collaboration are within the US the Office of Science and Technology Policy through the President have actually issued mandates, so there's a thing called the Holdren Memo, uh, which essentially says that all data generated with public money uh, needs to be accessible and shared uh, with the community. So this is a big driver, it's actually led to something called, uh, now in a second incarnation, Open Data 2.0. So there is, you know, uh, there is a lot of activity around this. I sit there at meetings of the White House with all of the federal agencies as we figure out how we're going to increase the accessibility uh, of data that's generated for the public good. Within the NIH itself, which is one of these agencies uh, within this whole ecosystem, uh, there is a data sharing policy already. It's not a very good one and it's not, it's not enforced. And as Daniel's pointed out to me in the past, and it's ironic, that we have a data sharing policy that's actually not machine readable. So we have no way of formally checking whether in fact people who get money from the government to do research are actually sharing that data even when they say they are. So we're kind of beginning to tighten up all that kind of thing so uh, there, will, there will be more formal uh, checking. But even just the accessibility of the data, um, different types of data, and I won't go into details, but uh, that we're actually making uh, new policies to make that data even more accessible. I'll just I'll leave it at that. But at the same time, clearly a lot of this data, there's a lot of sensitivity uh, around uh, patient data, for example, clinical data, uh, as to uh, how that's made available to uh, maintain uh, the, uh, the, uh, the security of the individual, should they, should they choose to, to be uh, uh, not identified. And this creates all sorts of problems. In the US, it's a total quagmire because, um, you know, I, I've asked leaders in this, no one actually knows who owns the patient record in the US, as far as I can tell. So if you have an electronic health record uh, in, in some countries that, that's accessible at some level in a de-identified form, in the US, it's not clear how accessible it should be or how accessible it is, uh, and if there's, there's lots of issues. But it's becoming an enormously valuable research tool uh, going forward to actually look at patient-centered outcomes based on all this information. So, um, you know, the point being is that what's happened is in biomedicine is there's this enormous amount of data. And it's, it's of different types. And, and lots of different um, types of data are becoming available. But that, you know, that creates lots of problems uh, with respect to the data, and obviously the kinds of things we've been talking about this morning already, locating, accessing, organizing, managing, uh, new analysis, presenting, disseminating, and all, this, all the associated training that goes with it. And so, uh, in other words, the whole, how we actually do research is really becoming very much, in this biomedicine arena, is becoming very much a digital enterprise. Way, you know, way different than what it was it really is a, a, a sea change, and uh, we don't, we're not particularly well set up to deal with this change. Um, even the idea of, of locating data is just one example. Um, that was why I asked the question about the OIs. We're not currently using a mechanism to resolve the location of data. So you can't, unless effectively, and it's true of software as well, so if you don't know where things are, it's very hard to find them.
obviously tools like GitHub, which we heard about, help, but um, it's not really enough. So there's an initiative now at the NIH, which I lead, which is called uh, the Big Data to Knowledge Initiative. Um, and I'm just going to say one or two things about what's going on there. Here's a website about it if you're interested. Um, one of the activities in this, which resonates with uh, very closely, I'd say, with Wiki Commons, is we're in the process of establishing a commons. Um, and effectively, it's a, a place, it's a research object sandbox. It's a collaborative environment. Um, and the idea is we have all this data. So we have, what's happened is, when people in Washington talk about this a lot, what we have is a non-funded a non mandate. So the President of the United States says, okay, we're going to share all public data. And then in the next breath says, you're going to do all this without any extra funding. Um, and of course that creates a problem. So we have the why we're doing this, but we don't really have the how. And so we've been looking at, at uh, ways of doing this. And you know, there's, there are different types of data. You know, there's a big thing we talk about in science is the long tail where uh, you know, there's a huge, a large number of, we talk about big data, and I'm not a fan particularly of the term big data, except in the, from the point of view that it's brought attention to a problem uh, that should have begun to be addressed long, long before this. But it's the basic idea that the long tail is there are a large number of relatively small data sets that when they're aggregated together, which is what you want to do to solve scientific problems, uh, that becomes big data. So there's all of this. Um, and then there are core facilities, some of which, for example, the Duke uh, genome sequencing, that generate enormous amounts of data. And then, of course, there's everything that's going on in the clinical arena uh, in generating clinical and patient data. And then there are all these out, uh, end game outcomes that uh, we want to get out of this that relate to, obviously, discovery, uh, while main, main, you know, making it usable and high quality, all this all the usual stuff. And there are various stakeholders in all of this. Um, and then what we're doing in this arena is to uh, essentially provide through some mechanisms. So uh, this year we're spending, I think, $30 million. Next year we'll be spending $100 million to stimulate activities in this area. Um, so there will be the development of a data discovery index and, uh, tools, software discovery index tools, the maintenance and development of standards, um, and uh, a whole series of uh, data science centers are being funded around the country. And I should say that this is, you know, data, scientific data is international. And it's, it's really, I think, held us back that it's funded on a national basis, uh, even though the data itself is international. And I've begun uh, talking to a lot, in fact, one of the reasons I'm here is, for example, I'm meeting the Welcome Trust folks tomorrow to see how we might, you know, create more cooperativity in these things um, across, across the scientific enterprise, uh, irrespective of boundaries. So, uh, you know, so this is what we're creating this commons. It's going to be a partnership, public-private partnership. Uh, it has to have a business model uh, for sustainability. I'm not going to get into the details of that. We have to address that if you're interested. Um, and you know, we're, we're really pushing forward on this. So uh, where can this community sort of help this initiative? Um, and where, how, you know, how can we help you, I hope? Uh, for me, it'd be great to interface in some way around these kinds of things. The Commons is uh, a notion that's been, uh, you know, dealt with a lot um, within the Wikimedia uh, organization. So I think we can learn a lot about that. Uh, clearly annotation, a lot of this scientific data, we need, you know, there's a lot of data. If this data goes into the commons, uh, there's the opportunity to do lots of different types of annotation by experts and non-experts alike. Um, we're actually trying to put some stimulus around uh, getting people who are not traditionally in the biomedical uh, arena to actually participate in, in our activities. So, for example, we're going to have a workshop this year, this physical year, with folks from the gaming community because we're very interested in trying to get them to start participating. And that goes, you know, computer scientists have not traditionally been part of our community, uh, statisticians and so forth. And then there's a, another sort of initiative which uh, I, I, I put a question mark by it because I, I don't know if this is actually going to uh, happen at this point. 
But it turns out that the President of the United States is very interested in genomic health and big data uh, for reasons that uh, I won't get into. But he's actually asked, he has two years left of his presidency, he wants a big scientific outgoing bank. He just started something called the Brain Initiative, which is a real effort uh, uh, sort of mapping and understanding brain function. Um, this other one, um, this is by no means necessarily going to happen. The, the thing we're pushing forward is the idea uh, of what we call a million patients for health. So it's really getting a million patients to donate their, their health records into a shared system, which would then be available for anyone to do research on. So if we de-identified data, and yes, there is a risk of re-identification, but the idea would be that right now we don't have such uh, a readily accessible resource. There have been a number of efforts, like something called Patients Like Me, which sort of attempt to do these kinds of things, but not on the scale of a very large cohort of patients. If we had that, and that would involve doing genome sequencing of every one of those million patients, we'd have an, a, a, a complete genome sequencing. We'd have the most amazing research tool that you could imagine. So, um, you know, we're really trying to uh, look at that. Uh, so, I you know, much prefer to have a dialogue about these things rather than drag it on for any, any period of time. Uh, so, you know, I'd say the closing thoughts is we, the biomedical research enterprise is going through this major sort of phase change to become a, a digital enterprise. And I think uh, it would be great to get this kind of community uh, engaged in that uh, transformation. And we really want to learn from you, you folks. So. That's, I'm uh, happy to go into any more details about these things, but that was kind of all I was going to say. Thank you, Bill. Now it's your turn. Yes? Um, so I was wondering if you mentioned you was on there, uh, the DOI. Association status, right. Association studies. studies. Um, so, have you heard of Smithia? It's not on the. It's not on the media project. Have you heard of Smithia? No. Okay. So, um, this isn't the um, the Wikimedia uh, Foundation project, but it uses media open software. And um, basically, it's a wiki where you uh, can store its tips, and you can actually. Um, it's a sort of structured manner, but it's sort of. So basically, it's two balls, but in a, in a Wikipedia format. Um, so I just. Um, right, no, actually, now you said that, like, I'm aware of it, yeah. Yeah, um, so. <clears throat> kind of, you know, um, so I guess. Uh, yes, well, I guess So actually, but it raises a sort of question about. I mean, what we, what I'm, the reason I'm here is because there's there are all these sort of grassroots, bottom-up efforts, various descriptions, what I think you just described one. And then there's this monolithic thing that sits out there that, you know, is top-down. And I don't think that there's been enough, inter you know, they don't necessarily meet in the middle. And uh, I think, so in other words, the idea that we, we could potentially stimulate those kinds of activities uh, in ways that haven't been done before by you know, this total bureaucratic organization. Um, I think there's real interest in, in trying to do some of these kinds of things. So, um, you know, it's kind of the message. In fact, my being here is exactly that, that, that kind of message. So I'm looking at ways, and I know because I've been involved before, until four or five months ago when I went to the NIH, I've been involved much more in the bottom-up types of efforts. And those efforts have often floundered, I think, right, because but, you know, you can have lots of enthusiasm, but occasionally you just need very small amounts of resources to make things happen. And, you know, I think it's, there, is a, there are ways that the NIH in this case should actually be stimulating those kind of activities. I'm not saying we should specifically fund that, but at least think about how we can help those kinds of organizations. Okay, so this uh, session has actually been convened by Wiki Project NIH, so there is uh, one way that the Wikimedia community organizes is in by Wiki Project, and so there's people who are working on Wikimedia articles and Wikimedia content generally around uh, NIH and its many 
branches. And one such grassroots initiative um, that is about to happen is called Wiki Hates Cancer. It's modeled on different uh, um, initiatives like Wiki Loves Monument, Wiki Loves Libraries, but there's also certain things we hate. And so this will be a series of hackathons at the NIH uh, with um, the participation of the Wikimedia community. And um, if there is anyone in the room who can tell more about this, uh, I would be happy for that. Maybe Lane? No, okay. Well, what, 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 what are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> what, what wiki project in NIH? No, no, wiki hates cancer. Oh, wiki hates cancer. Oh, so the idea is, so uh, there's a lot of people, it seems to be the case that Wikipedia is a popular source of information on a great many subjects, including health information. So that's not trivial to a lot of health organizations. They, they wouldn't expect that. It. It's not well known even that Wikipedia is popular. Uh, so for example, if there's a health organization, if it's their mission to bring health information to the people who are seeking it, and if they want to reach the most number of people with the greatest efficiency of the lowest cost, the, the highest population, then it might be the case that if they put their information into a Wikipedia article, perhaps an article about a disease, a medical procedure, a drug, or whatever, if you're just trying to educate the public and you don't care how the public gets the information, it might be a, a good idea to put the information into Wikipedia. So looking at the, the, the traffic to different Wikipedia articles, perhaps Wikipedia articles about cancer, supposing a person is told by their doctor that they have cancer or they're at risk for cancer, supposing they have a loved one who has cancer and they're trying to find information about it for them, then what this wiki, <laughs> wiki hates cancer or wiki loves cancer prevention or wiki wants to inform the public about cancer project might do would be to uh, do training drives at nonprofit organizations or health education organizations to make sure that all the public health messages that everyone agrees everyone should have access to could be found in Wikipedia articles on the presumption that when someone goes to Google or Bing or any search engine, they don't know where to go to look for health information, they would be able to find it in Wikipedia. Actually, there's already a large Wiki Wikipedia community at Wiki Project Medicine that's been doing this for a long time, but also, there's, there's a lot of health articles on Wikipedia. They could all use improvement. And it's not just about English language. Whatever we do with English language, that's, that's not most of the world. We really need not only to perfect the entirety of all health information in English, but actually it needs to be perfect in every language, accessible to every country. So we, we need some help from some direction or another, and it's not certain how that should come to be. Thanks for the thorough presentation. <laughs> um, I invite more of these, and we have uh, some more time for further questions and comments. Yes, Kai. Um, so am I right uh, that what you're saying is you're missing a big opportunity because patient data is by default confidential. And if we were to, if these were open, then, then th we'd have a chance to well, you know what I'm trying to say, I can't yeah, yeah. understand it's your part. No, I mean, I think, I mean, you know, there's, as we go along, there's no question that the, the likelihood of someone being re-identified if they actually were to provide their information in a de-identified form is just going to increase and increase. So we need, we need obviously, legislation to protect the rights of the individual. That's, you know, that's, uh, of course, that's always way too slow in coming. But what I am saying is if, if regardless of that, if people are willing to share that information. And, you know, it's, it's clear that particularly, obviously, in the kind of situation we were just discussing where, uh, you know, you, there's loved ones or there, you're actually, you know, uh, suffering from a condition yourself, then, of course, the likelihood of sharing goes way up. But there are lots of people still who would be, you know, really willing to share that information. Now, it's, you know, I, I'm only particularly familiar, and even then not so, very much with the US situation. But, you know, if you look, at the, in the, because you've got different healthcare providers and different uh, insurance companies and everything in the US, uh, it's not actually clear who owns the record. So, what can happen right now is, because of the big, well, first of all, until recently, we didn't have enough electronic health records to make much of this worthwhile, but in the last few years, there's been a real push in the US to, to address that. So it's still far from perfect. So, I'll, I'll, I'll get to you in a second. So, um, 
you know, we're trying to, you know, so that it, it, it is becoming available. So you can get a copy, uh, but if you have that copy, it's not to say you own, you own the copyrights, your own, your own health record. Um, and uh, but then, you know, what else can you do with it? I mean, presumably we haven't actually, as I'm aware, tried, you know, I mean, that's sort of happened through things like, as I mentioned, patients like me, where there is a collation of that kind of information. Um, so this would really be doing that on a, on a more grand scale uh, as, as a project. And it would need to be tied in with a lot of other types of information uh, as that happens. So uh, the idea of if you were to donate that information into a central repository that, or a central place, that that would then trigger you know, a, a swap package which would come to you, which would then lead to a complete genome sequencing which is now affordable. So, uh, you know, and that then you would have what we're striving for increasingly, which is a sort of complete health record that goes from your genomic and genetic information all the way up ultimately to your environment. Uh, uh, so, I wish there are efforts for that as well. So, uh, that's, that's the goal. Thanks for asking, but the, uh, the sort of form that you envision for the commons is? Is it a tool or is it a standard or, or something else? Uh, so, yeah, let me say a little more about that if I may. So, the idea is basically a concept. So, it's really, and it, the idea is that it has two rules, at least initially. One is that whatever you put in there, whatever reason, which is called a research object, could be data, software, narrative, so on, that they have an identifier can't be what I was asking about the OI, so that there's a resolvable identifier, and then there's, you know, there's established provenance associated with each. And different types, different uh, object types can have different levels of provenance, but there would be a core set of provenance. That is really, all. anyone who wants to be compliant with the commons, that's all they agree to support. So it could be a public cloud provider, it could be a private cloud provider, it could be an institutional repository, it could be, uh, you know, whoever. Yeah. So, and then what we're, the business model around this from the NIH's point of view is what happens right now is that we give out the pools of money for people to buy servers and do all this kind of stuff, right? So, the idea would be not to swap this overnight, but moving in this direction would be to provide credit, compute credit. So instead of getting, you get the same amount of dollars but you wouldn't spend it on your own servers, you'd spend it in the commons. And you could spend it, so if you were, and if the kind of work you did involved uh, little computing and lots of data storage, then you would go to a commons provider that actually was you know, the most proper, you know, the most efficient, cost effective for, for you for that, uh, for what you do. So it would drive, the idea is it would drive competition in the marketplace. Um, and then, you know, you would do that. And then we're developing a set of tools uh, through this extramural community uh, to, to support uh, this kind of endeavor. So, <coughs> excuse me, there will be a data discovery index which would then uh, troll over everything in the commons and effectively uh, catalog that, including uh, the amount of access any commentary that people wanted to say on any of those research objects. Um, so that's that's sort of the idea. One of the, the kinds of things that we've been thinking about putting in there to seed it is things like uh, we could take the, the subset of PubMed Central that truly is you know, publicly accessible to anyone. Uh, we could put that in the comments. And you know, the kinds of tools that uh, Daniel's been developing uh, for extracting and that kind of thing would be open and you know, this, this would be accessible much more, the content would be much more accessible. At least that's the, that's the, that's the idea. I should say this isn't a grandiose spend hundreds of millions of dollars to make this happen and then just have it fall flat on its face. It's, it's basically, let's, let's try prototyping, let's try and be agile, let's run some, run some, um, uh, some, uh, you know, some pilots and see what it looks like. Is this going to work? Um, will this kind of business model work? So that's sort of, in a, in a nutshell, the idea. So another, who here is just is familiar with DiggySnip? Uh, sorry, DiggyGap. Probably anyway, OK. 
Okay, so DBGAP is a patient oriented database. There's been a, a, a huge resistance to put that into the cloud because of you know, fear about uh, security and things. Well, finally that's moving into this environment. So it's the, the first sign that, of, of, I think, uh, you know, more, more realism in the, in the system associated with patient data as well. That's perhaps an aside. But that, that's the basic idea of it. It's clear. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, yeah, thanks for the additional question, but the time has run out. Uh, maybe you can follow up later on. The slides, for the Phil, are on the submission page for this session, along with a, a link to the Big Data to Knowledge Initiative. Uh, and uh, you're welcome to also tweet to him um, and to continue the discussion this way. Thank you. Um, we wish to just discuss a little bit about um, the problematics of um, open source in the space at the moment, um, that there is um, potentially a, a marriage between um, <laughs> between project bad marriage between projectors and uh, open source software. Um, let me just see if I can just very quickly get something that's going to work. Okay, here we go. This will work for some, some of the work. Um, right. So, um, Yes, good morning. My name is uh, Adam Hyde. Um, I'm here just to facilitate this discussion. Uh, I wanted to give it a quick framing. We've met everybody on the panel so far, I believe, but maybe we can just, again, do a quick introduction. So I don't know if you can just start by saying your name and who you are. So, Martin, you My name is Martin Penner. I'm a software developer for Open Access Publisher Plus. I'm Daniel Mitch, I'm a researcher at the Natural History Museum in Berlin. Uh, I mean, well, I run technology for a publishing company, you like, so I have a insight into the whole software factory from CBC, what looks like on the web. It's obvious. Sorry, I can't hear you. We can't hear you back here. Oh, sorry, is that, is that, can you, can you hear, is that better? Yeah, yes. thank you. Uh, I'm John Shaki, I run a product at Boston for Better Science, so Access Culture. Right, so um, we, we wish to have this as a discussion about, um, it's called the full o OA stack, which basically suggests that there should be you know, a full stack of open access tools available for manuscript processing from authoring right through to uh, publication file transfer. And the problem is, is that there are tools out there that do very bits and pieces that fulfill this entire workflow. Um, and we really want to discuss the problematics of that and um, you know, advocate for more tools to be developed in the space, but pull out also some of the problems and some of the sort of um, big uh, blind spots uh, that exist currently. So I just wanted to just give a very light framework for this. Um, just to say at the beginning that, um, if you can see this, there's basically um, five steps for um, publication. This is abstracted, right? This doesn't map onto everything, but this is very general. Um, for, for publishing and open access, the first of all, um, is the manuscript production, which uh, generally happens, you know, this is the author writing their um, uh, manuscript. It goes through a process of submission, 
um, uh, which they submit to a journal, processing, review, we're going to miss discussions about you know, open versus closed line reviews at the moment. Uh, we're talking more about tools rather than process, um, although obviously they're interlinked. And file conversion, which is also still called typesetting in this area, uh, but this is also syndication of these kinds of um, issues. So just to very quickly go through these steps very, very quickly, and then we'll get to the discussion. Um, production and authoring currently, um, the authors generally produce in Microsoft Word, uh, which is a, which is basically the, the source of all, all the evils um, right at the beginning. Um, because it's a, um, well, DocX is a um, is something that you can actually, has uh, embedded XML, but it's, it's uh, not very consistent and it's very difficult to work with and there's a lot of anomalies, um, links out to um, uh, uh, references and citations are not consistent. Um, the way that it deals with uh, math is not consistent with standards, blah, blah, blah. So this is where everything bad starts. Um, and this is partly cultural and partly technical. It is just a fact that most authors use Microsoft Word. Um, they also use um, uh, email, so there's very little collaboration often in this space um, that we would talk about as being collaborative. Um, you know, it's basically you have a Microsoft Word file and you email it around. And uh, when you want to um, make a change, you save the, the file as, you know, version 7.2221 and then send it on to whoever else down the, down the line needs to look at it. Um, and Adobe Photoshop is a favorite tool of uh, researchers and, uh, because they have all sorts of magic that they um, have to, uh, with filters and blah, 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 that they have to execute to make an image, whether it's a chart or whatever, compliant with whatever the journals require, right? So there's all sorts of magic that goes on in this space with people, you know, um, sharing some of their um, special tricks that they use to get a you know, particular color that a, in, in a chart that a particular journal might use. I mean, this sounds very much like we're back in the dark ages. So this is the state of the art in, in manuscript production right now. This is what actually happens. Um, we go through submission, which is, um, there are a lot of publishing platforms out there that deal with submission. Submission is so you get the manuscript and you throw it over the wall into the, into the journal space. And, um, and these are mostly proprietary um, and they're a very aggressive space which, um, which have a lot of strategies to keep, where the vendors try and keep the publisher within the space. Um, and they generally deal with the, the binary formats as an attachment, right? So there's no transparency in the content. Um, and this is where um, an author would go to fill out like meters and meters and meters of form fields um, to attach all the metadata to their binary uh, research. Um, so these are largely closed. There are some open ones, uh, uh, such as OJS, etc. Um, there's pro the manuscript um, processing. Uh, this is where um, the data projector runs out of space for my to be able to show you because I can't scroll down any further. <laughs> Let's see if I can do this. Um, uh, the processing is actually where you, um, where the, the uh, the journal deals with the article, right? So they, they, they process it. And they generally have these proprietary platforms, which is their data repository, and they, they find their way through this maze, often just a data store. And they often develop their own workflows external to this because sometimes they don't encompass workflow management tools. And um, so the journal staff often uh, deal with the necessity to generate their own ad hoc management tools. So they use things like uh, wikis, they use uh, you know Trello, Google Docs, where they keep workflow records of how things should be processed. Uh, they use tools like Salesforce and ways which Salesforce um, is not meant to be used. Um, and you know they also use interestingly things like GitHub as well occasionally. And it's just very good to call out here the fact that these are all proprietary tools largely. They use you know wikis like Confluence for example. They use GitHub which is a you know, a closed um, application. So there's very tools in this domain which are open source and actually um, very few tools have been open source and owned and, and controlled by the people that actually use them. I can't scroll down any further, so I'll just keep going uh, from what I can see. Then there's um, review, which is when the reviewers come to the manuscript, they review it and then they, um, uh, they make a call on what they see and, and there's all this background processing, communication between the academic editor and the reviewers. And this is also largely done through the closed source platforms, through email and through Microsoft Word. And then lastly, there's the typesetting phase where you get the manuscript and then you convert it into whatever formats that you need to distribute it for syndication or publishing or whatever. 
And often, and this is not just the case of, um, of science publishing, but this is true for the vast majority of any kind of publisher, is that they essentially uh, email a zip file with all the, all the content of the manuscript and all the metadata to somebody literally in, uh, often in, in China, and they manually uh, retype set this in XML, blah, blah, blah. So they're often, for example, in, in sometimes working from PDF, where they'll get a PDF manuscript and then recreate that in XML for syndication. Um, which is just absolute madness. Um, and, and all of this, obviously, you know, if you have to go back for revisions before this stage, and, you know, the, the person at the end of the road has to, has to actually diff um, uh, one version of a manuscript versus earlier versions to make sure that they've got the right ones and, and that the changes are all the same, blah, 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 before they do the type setting. So this is really, like, there's a lot of burden and pain in this entire process. And, um, you know, so that's... That's just to give you an understanding of, it, of what's happening now. It's pretty bad. It's pretty horrible. Um, and I just wanted to throw it out to discussion, to facilitate this discussion. I thought maybe since John is the only person who hasn't spoken so far on the panel, I'd just um, maybe start off with, maybe you can tell us something about what you understood from the lab visits that you did in terms of working process um, for manuscript production. Oh, yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think what Adam was talking about around collaboration is really one key point, which is uh, while science and the creation of the research article is a very collaborative thing, the creation of the submission file that is sent out to a publisher is not necessarily considered what we would call collaborative. Uh, many times um, the heads of labs will be um, uh, gatekeepers of being you know, the keyboard to a word file. Um, people will not be able to actually uh, type phrases into uh, the research article without permission. Um, versioning also is done through, uh, like Adam was saying, uh, through email exchanges. Um, uh, you know, the file name is changed to V3 or V4 and up to like you know, V100. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, miscommunication or misunderstanding about what is the, the most recent. Um, also, it's not just about people using Word, it's also people using really old versions of Word. And it's not just about people using DocX, it's about people using Doc. Um, and these files then are, uh, you know, have varying amounts of styling or metadata actually is inside of them, captured inside of them. Many people are putting, you know, what we already know, you know highlighting, bolding, um, pushing up the font size to denote a header versus actually styling something as a header. And I guess the thing that I would say that's most troubling around that is that the tools themselves are stopping the collaboration and they're reinforcing a culture that isn't truly collaborative in the creation. So the, one of the threads that Adam, was, as we're going through, is this is, um, the, the culture uh, has to change as much as the tools have to change. And the um, collaboration within the tools or tool set is something that's kind of consistent across, it's not being reinforced, and uh, across needs to uh, be updated. Yeah. Ian, can you say anything about any particular painful experiences you've had <laughs> in this space? I'll, um, I, I think the point I'd like to make uh, is more one about the history of how we got here on the post-submission stage. And um, it sort of really happened in the early 90s with the explosion and cheap availability of desktop publishing tools. At that point, what happened is uh, Publishers up until then kept a lot of their technology in house, but saw the opportunity to offshore that because the technology to offshore became commoditized. And from that, 1991, 92, at that point, publishers decided they were no longer technology companies. They would only deal with the financial aspects and the, and the um, management aspects. And so even publishers themselves are also suffering from this. This is not something that we merely impose upon you guys because we don't like you. And you mention things we do because we don't like it. But this is as much a pain for publishers as well as for authors. And so it's sort of a collective uh, a delusion and, and psychosis that we have found ourselves in and we need to break free. Yeah. Yeah, multiple comments on this. So first I would actually like uh, to see someone trying this all in media wiki and technically it's possible. Scholar Peter is an example of where this is being done, it's just not quite popular. Uh, second, beyond all these steps, from the Wikimedia perspective, we are the large-scale reuser of the content that comes out of scholarly publishing. 
uh, even if all of this were open source, uh, we would still not be in, uh, in an ideal position because the format that comes out also has to be first an open format and second compliant to a standard. The standard has to be specific enough to actually make it uh, possible to do large scale reuse the way we want to do this. And uh, so um, I just want to illustrate that it's a long way to go and we uh, should encourage openness at each of these individual steps. Well, I think because others have described the delusion or craziness of the current system, I'd like to go more into that just to say that this is not only costing a lot of money, which is a problem, it takes time, so this delays science becoming publicly available, and it also creates barriers, so I think Publishing science has become easier, but it's still something where you have to have a certain set of resources to deal with all this craziness, and this, this creates barriers. So if, you, if you're a community, you want to publish something you find important, it's not as easy as it could be. Um, in terms of solving this, uh, I think my, my main sort of goal or approach for this would be that these uh, a lot of different things that relate to each other, but I think what is important is to build building blocks um, that work with each other, and I think that's sort of one of the experience with open source software in general. There are a few tools that do a lot of things, but mostly it's things that do one thing well and work with something else, whether it's a database, a website, or whatever, and that this is all infrastructure that can work together. And I think if somebody builds the perfect tool that does fully publishing and open source, this will be nice, but after three years it will fall apart because it's so difficult to maintain. So we should think about and maybe there are more building pieces than the one that you mentioned. Um, that you build one of these pieces really well, and over time we have a nice set of tools that works together. And I think this is totally open source territory. If you look at where open source is successful with this kind of infrastructure, I mean, that should be possible. That's so that if you do the session again in 10 years, it will be very different. A, a little different. <laughs> um, so, sorry, yeah, one more aspect. Uh, the open access movement in trying to make its case has largely focused on lobbying, like uh, persuading people by words, by uh, like the respect that the listener has to the, the one who's talking. Uh, but if we were to leverage tools, software, more of the um, case would actually be made more pervasively. And uh, one way to get there would actually be to engage with the open source community in a more direct fashion, like have open access publishers participate in hackathons on a more regular basis. Ian uh, was involved in organizing one of these in London a year ago, but we need more of those. And uh, we need these well, interactions to focus on uh, each of these individual steps, and then we can actually really uh, make progress uh, rather quickly. In the Wikimedia movement, we do this on a regular basis. For many of the things for which there is no or infrastructure or funding available, it, it works, then at least we have some prototype on the base of that prototype and get some more funding and some more resources to actually work out something that can handle production level. I also add this another part, which is right at the end, uh, uh, which sits with you guys as well as researchers. And I'm holding it here in my hands, it's paper, it's print, it's this conceptual, persistable thing. So uh, we, we try really hard to innovate on the web in views on, on, on how the scholarly articles look, but we're continually being asked to produce PDF. And many workflows need to produce PDF because they have print outputs. So we need to move to a place where publishers feel more comfortable in dropping their print publications, and we need to move to a place where we can convince you that there are viable technical alternatives to PDF, which can provide you with persistence on your local file system, the ability to annotate, and the ability to print nicely. And I think there's still a big gap on on that part as well, we need to work hard on Yeah, and it's partly cultural too because um, PDF is still considered a, a sort of a currency within the research circles. So the researchers themselves have to feel that validated by seeing something print like. But, but I think there's hope. And I, and I think when I look around at me, I see a lot of Max. One of the things I find hopeful is the explosion of experiences that people have in creating documents through the iPad and through mobile devices where. No one will, no, you can create, a lot of you write on your iPhone, um, a lot of you will take quick notes on your iPhone. I bet none of you open words to do that on your iPhone. And so there's, there's a growing feeling that, yeah, you can create text on things and platforms that are not Word, and maybe that can permeate and begin to 
to allow people to look at tooling at the early stage with, with which they're comfortable with, which can provide a route out to some of the pathologies that you see here. And a, big, a big part of what we're talking about is the ability to take research and reuse, right? And reuse the, the findings. And I, the example came up previously about you know, the, the data policy that itself was not machine readable. And um, the, just the, the goal of having um, a, a finished document in PDF, but also in XML, um, is not enough because even XML that we are creating or the market that we're creating is not truly machine readable. It's not consistent enough for someone to take a full corpus of PubMed Central or something and actually do anything with it. So there's this, there's a uh, there's a, a responsibility from you know, a, a publisher side, but also a content creator side, so further upstream to not just create something that's beautiful or something that's an image or you know a PDF, and not just something that is more markup and, and, and uh, flexible like XML, but uh, something that is actually machine readable and can be reusable uh, in, uh, in a more effective way. So let's start the discussion going. Let's run up here, physical camera. That's uh, Cameron Allen from, from FOSS. Well, I was struck by Daniel's comment about the lack of interaction between publishers interested in this stuff and, for instance, with the media community and with Phil's comment in the previous talk about the, the, the lack of connection between bottom-up initiatives and top-down initiatives. It seems like I've heard this so, so many times over the last couple of days. There's a space in the middle that our collective cultures are not good at connecting through. And I don't have any brilliant ideas about how to do that, but it seems like somehow figuring out how we create that community layer in the middle is a very critical thing, more, much more critical than the social problems of the, of the, uh, of the technical problems. Can I just check the people in the back? Were you able to hear, Phil? Not very well. <coughs> Uh, sorry, Phil, Cameron. Uh, sorry, Phil, sorry, Cameron. Um, <laughs> Cameron, would you mind just quickly standing up and just projecting that back? So that's, I was just trying to draw a, draw a parallel between what Daniel said about publishers not actually interacting necessarily with open source communities and what Phil had said about bottom up initiatives not meeting top down initiatives. And that there's this seat, and the same thing has come up many times over the last couple of days. And that seems solving that piece in the middle of how we can interact with different cultures um, to be productive seems to be a, a real challenge. And hackathons or uh, similar less structured meetings are actually a good way to overcome those barriers where you bring people from the top and the bottom or from the open source and open access or whatever to rather um, dis distant communities together in, in a small interactive community that works pretty well. And, and we are a lot of the Wikimedia movement is testament to that. I think we have one at the back. So um, if the, the top is teaching publishers to use open tools and the bottom is teaching the general user community, academics, perhaps in the case of scholarly publishing, to use the same tools, who are the people in the middle? Well, I, I guess. One thing I'd say is that uh, the tools exist. I mean, we've been touching on this, right? Tools that do exist. These are there's small. Uh, either there are some production ready tools, but uh, there are small projects that have been very successful in some key areas. Um, the the dissection of the workflow the way Adam did. Um, in each of those, there are open source tools. Uh, the challenge is connecting the dots and. I think what from the top down what people are looking for and uh, what has been a challenge for open access publishers in the past is looking for total solutions and kind of looking for something that is quick. You know, where do you find those? You find those by going to a vendor and what, what vendors were out there, the vendors that had already been there and had already done that. You know, Word was already there and other platforms were there for submission. But I think I, I think the people in the middle are people like the ecosystem. I would point to vendors, publishers work with, uh, people we need to submit to like Crossref and like uh, PubMed Central. PubMed Central has a huge weight in this because one of the reasons we have uh, one of the most closed aspects of our publishing ecosystem is to produce the XML that PubMed Central requires to provide all the great services that they require. But that one component is possibly the most closed of all of the components in the tool chain. Um, vendors, their API is FTP and their uh, um, uh, 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 document transfer format of choice is PDF, XML, and TIFF. So th those are the people that know. I mean, I just, um, one of the things I see, and I talk about the, the lock-in that publishers have with vendors a lot, 
Um, they're really kind of in the same situation that a lot of trade publishers are in with Amazon, right? They're like they basically two major scalable uh, manuscript tracking system vendors out there. And uh, every, pub every major publisher uses them. And um, their only choice is to like move from one to the other, right? Um, and that's a devil's deal, you know, it's because they, you know, they're not really going to get better service that way. Right? But a lot of innovation, a lot of uh, things that publishers want to do are held up because they can't actually, um, you know, get their, their vendor to, to build the tools to allow them to try these things, to try different ways of doing peer review, to try different ways of doing output. And um, they don't see a lot of benefit in moving to just the competition because they're going to be in the same situation. So I do think that the thing that might break the logjam here is if there is a scalable open source tool that's available because effectively that means they can make the jump without just you know jumping out of the you know out of the frying pan and into the fire. Um, but the problem is the tools that are out there at the moment don't scale up. They're not they're not going to support a pause one. Or right. I mean, and, and it's the underlying uh, problem with this that scenario is actually the data that they're storing and requiring. And I mean, it's not just that the vendors exist; it's that the vendors are imposing basically standards on the community, which is, exactly. and they're all closed standards. Yep. Yeah. Oh, can we just? Uh, I, I don't quite understand the point. Uh, Would well, you mind um, standing up so yeah. and projecting a bit There's back? There's some I don't understand it because uh, uh, the, uh, I've never seen a publisher not being happy with the lake. Uh, um, oh, oh, so 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 so, 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 so most publishers so most publishers that take LaTeX convert it into Doc and then Doc through uh, their pipeline. Fine, but then yeah. the archive okay, I put LaTeX and sure. it's, uh, all the information. It's yeah. not optimal to do many things, but at least there is a text. And so, that, I mean, I think that's then, what. Then, you know, but the main point is uh, uh, I don't understand what you want to do. If the author does not prepare his data in a proper format and to be reused, uh, then what's the point of trying to extract this from other sources? It's a problem. If he doesn't uh, prepare it for a reuse, it means that it's not good enough. So the point was about LaTeX um, as it's been one possible good solution for structuring data and, and that's because you can author in a very structured way and it's very semantic and uh, so you don't have the same problems as you do with Word so why not you know, move towards this space which is um, one possibility. But John, you wanted to say I was just going to, I think this, your second point answered the first which is it's a cultural uh, problem from it that starts at the author side. Um, it's truly like our people who are building science and building knowledge, are they um, interested in it being machine readable or reusable later downstream? And I think that that's really the point here is where can we help assist through tools development? Um, because that culture has not changed. There's not 100% authorship in something like law tech because people have bought in further upstream into things like work. I think it's a small comment. I think the best thing about the tool is to like one kind in which people put what they want. Then it's up to them to put the resources that can be reviewed or not. Right. Yeah. Well, that's where we are right now. And we're. Um, it's not a problem of form, it's a problem of. Uh, it's a, it's a complicated uh, form. It's a complicated problem because the formats themselves are the ones that are then causing. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think people are intentionally saying, I am now going to create a non reusable document. <laughs> right? They're not saying, oh, I want to close up my data and not let anyone have it. They're saying, I'm going to write and I'll just fire up the tool to time which is work. It's not intentional at the moment, and the tools are forcing people down the route. And what we're saying is, let's try and help move people into a world where the tools that they have to hand also enable openness. Yeah. I was talking to a publisher a while ago, and I was saying, I'm ready to make that, and he said, yeah, but the submitted that will just convert it to MS Word. Yep. <laughs> it's really a bit depressing. Um, if they're I mean, there are plenty of people who want to use these tools and will use them even if they then get immediately converted into something less machine readable as soon as it is fit. But if, if people would accept LaTeX, if people would accept HTML5, XML, MathML, whatever, and use it, then you would get some people submitting a variety of these formats, and it would save work. vendors here possibly we, we, we do that we get the word files and the latex files and you're absolutely right the 
industry standard uh, because because 90 more than 95 percent of people who write papers write Microsoft Word. So the if you like the composition or typesetting industry has standardized with very very expensive tools around work. Um, we haven't, but generally people have. So when they get that two or three percent that comes in LaTeX, they jam it into that, uh, they shoehorn it into the, into the word workflow because there's, that's just the easiest way to do it. Um, and so, so just on that tech, I'm a tech user for, for, for many years, but you can't make people use things they don't like. So someone in humanities is not going to use tech. Someone, you know, I collaborate with people who just, they just get sick when they look at these codes around. They just want to say, see something that's bold, italic, etc. But we can, what we need to do is to give authors things that actually make their life easier. So something like a web base, I think that's what we, that's one idea, right? Something like a blog. You know, people are quite happy writing a blog. So if they just log in and start writing their paper and you give them the tools around that, that actually ends up being a very structured document. Is there any, I mean, there's two people who have already spoken before, which to me. We'll do one more question. Can we get it? I mean, so it seems to me that there's been a bit missing in this discussion, and it's sort of implied and not stated, which is it would be really, I mean, in one way, we're dreaming here, but the dream would be that effectively publishing is changing the access control and what you've been doing in the lab every day. Right? So, I mean, we're still using the paper as this sort of, you know, object to publish. So if, if, we, if we could begin to move away from that where there's much more connection with what people use in the lab every day. And we don't even have that yet. I mean, that's the problem. We don't have, even right at the beginning, people are using Word to maintain the lab notebook or they're worse than that, they're just writing it with pencil. But, so, you know, I think we've got to start at that point and go forward. Thank you, I think that's all we have time for. But I think we're hanging out to and on, and on Tuesday, London Open Drinks. Can I get some beer? Yeah, it's 100 quid behind the bar already, so uh, yeah, get that ready. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>